thank you, Professor Vishnu. Thank you, Mumtaz. Thank you, Arun. And thank you, though they are not here, Kriya IT team. Although I claim to speak on history of science and technology, I would be lost without them in terms of technological setup. So thank you so much for being here today. I know choosing a post-lunch session could not have been an easy decision. Uh, but thank you so much. I will be speaking uh, on a part of my PhD research, something that I'm also uh, currently working on. So basically I look at uh, the relation between the social world and statistics in colonial and post-colonial India. Okay, this is what I would like to do as the spoiler alert. This is the main argument that I'm hopefully going to make through the presentation. And uh, it's useful for you as well, because if I am unable to make it by the end of the presentation, you can call me out on that. Uh, so this is what I'm going to show, how statistical methods and statistical abstraction take root in the social political grounds of colonialism and nationalism. Now, what I mean by that is, for instance, to situate my work in overall scholarship as well, there is a lot of uh, scholarship uh, on European history of statistical thinking, how we had the rise of statistical thinking in the modern period, especially from the 18th, 19th century onwards, but in Europe, right? Uh, and these scholars have shown that statistics is embedded in the social context. Statistics is not a natural historical category or discipline that is completely, as Professor Vishnu was saying, completely innocent or politically or social neutral. But at the same time, the scholarship also focuses on European history, which is kind of to say that once we have the emergence of statistical methods and statistical reasoning and the discipline itself, it then just can be transported to other contexts, for instance, to the colonies with European colonialism. Uh, but then on the other hand, there is this scholarship in India. Uh, Bana Cohn was one of the four pioneers of that scholarship, who show how the colonial state introduced through their various enumerative mechanisms, especially the census, this idea that people could be counted and the number of, say, Hindus or Muslims or the number of people in particular castes had some political relevance, had political significance, right? But between these two sets of scholarship, the question I am asking is, how did the substance of statistical thinking or statistical reasoning as a discipline itself change with the rise of colonialism? Uh, and when I say colonialism, I also mean the responses to colonialism, which is anti-colonial movements, as well as elite nationalism, and I will go into the details of that. Also, as a clarificatory point, it would be good to say what I mean by statistics. So, for instance, to again differentiate my work from uh, the existing scholarship in India, Whereas the kind of scholarship that Barna Cohn and others, people look at the census. So when they say statistical data, or even when the colonial state is dealing with statistical data, the thrust of this would be in terms of demographic enumeration. So basically you're counting people, right? But when I say statistics, I include that, but I also look at the institutionalization of this as a discipline. So it also entails more sophisticated analytical statistical methods. For instance, you um, uh, there is something called the coefficient of correlations and that kind of analysis, which is generally not taken into account by this kind of scholarship. So as a statistics, I mean all of those, the simple act of enumeration, counting people and saying how many people or how many uh, individuals you have in various social categories, social identities, but at the same time, it also includes the way we calculate different um, categories that does not in that sense exist in nature. So you, for instance, you have, uh, you collect data from the field and then you come up with a category that is called mortality rate of the group. Uh, or you come up with a coefficient of racial likeness, which determines to what extent two different caste groups or religious groups uh, are ethnically related or uh, racially related, right? So all of those complicated analysis and statistical reasoning are included in my uh, focus. So uh, throughout the um, throughout the presentation, I'm going to show how the motivations and the desires that are generated with colonialism, anti-colonialism, and elite nationalism inform 
the drives of statistical reasoning or inform how statistics develops or what kind of method is given particular focus in, in this developed history. So these are the sections I will work through in my presentation. First, I'll talk about colonial statistics, what that entailed. And then in response to it, there was this rise of anti-colonial or nationalist statistics. Uh, and how those try to differentiate themselves from what the colonial state is doing. Uh, then we have some uh, a discussion on the original contribution by Indian statisticians. So to show that they were not just pushing back against colonial statistics and that they were not simply applying to their empirical context what European intellectuals have already done, uh, but they actually contributed to the global discipline. Uh, and then we'll talk about the how the social life or the social worldview or the social exigencies informed what kind of subjects or what kind of methods statisticians found urgent to be developed. And then finally, I will share my reflections on how this, what this history tells us of other things. So this is the part on the colonial statistics. So this is late 19th century. We have the British colonial state in India in the subcontinent. Um, now, there are various methods that are introduced into the subcontinent for various purposes, for producing knowledge about Indians, for governing them, for surveillance and so on. But most, like all of these, the, uh, the categories I mentioned on the four corners, all of these have a certain kind of qualitative statistical reasoning embedded in it. So we have firstly the census, which is most talked about uh, in Indian history where you go out and count individuals, count people, and you count various categories, uh, especially caste and religion, that were not, uh, that not recorded before the colonial state. Uh, so basically, just to clarify, you people, uh, so the British colonial state, for instance, were counting how many, so these are the categories they were using, classifications, right? How many tribal, how many people are there in tribal communities, how many people, uh, Hindus, how many Muslims, and this generated a different kind of thinking which was lacking in among Indians before, as scholars have shown, and we can get to that in the QA. Uh, then we have police records. Uh, so there is this idea that, uh, and again, it's emerging uh, with European race science that's happening in the metropole. The idea that you can actually, uh, so criminality is racially inherent, so you can actually predict criminal traits. So you have that, again, that kind of enumerative logic to uh, differentiate between different people which ethnic groups are more prone to criminality and there is this whole uh, again connected to like physical anthropology surveys so anthropo it's called anthropometric surveys so you calculate you record various physical features of individuals and then map that result onto the group to categorize what racial type this group belongs to if they are inherently criminal uh, what to what degree they would be inherently criminal and so on uh, and then you have public health surveys. Uh, so this is uh, uh, these are several decades. Uh, see a lot of rounds of epidemic diseases, so high mortality rates, famines. So that kind of record, less intensive record happening at that. And then there is public circulation of these data. So people's thinking also get aligned, and people also start Indians start responding to this kind of enumerative thinking. So what? What happens through all these kinds of enumerative surveys is also the colonial state interacting with the Indian public at large. And through these various surveys, especially through the physical anthropology surveys, the census, the colonial state basically produces this narrative. They believe that Indians lack an inherent enumerative sense. They do not have a sense of numbers. They do not have a sense of calculation. And just to give an example, um, so when uh, the census record, uh, the census takers, record keepers, they go and ask people various things. One among them is age. So they go and ask people what your age is. It's a very common phrase, and this phrase gets in internalized even by Indian intellectuals that I look at after this. Uh, the phrase, so they go and ask people what your age is, and they say we don't know for sure, but around twenty or forty. So these charges that becomes a very popular phrase and colonial census takers have taken a back. I mean, what range is that? 20 to 40. So that, this is one of the examples through to show that the colonial state believes that statistical reasoning is something that is part of 
the modern civilized apparatus and Indians lack, Indians have a lack of it and therefore they are racially, civilizationally inferior, right? So interestingly, a lot of 20th century Indian intellectuals respond to this narrative. In a sense, on the one hand, they do internalize this narrative, but like the colonial state, they are not obviously happy, satisfied to just sit on this narrative. So they want to push back against this narrative. So they want to develop this culture of enumerative reasoning. So they have internalized the urgency or the indispensability of this kind of reasoning for a modern nation, for a modern state. But at the same time, they want to also resist the idea that Indians can never be enumerative. Uh, so I look at the works of some of these people. Uh, foremost among them would be Prashantha Chandra Mohananobish, who is even today known as the father of Indian statistics. Uh, then there is, uh, the only person I couldn't get an image of is Jyoti Pramal Dabho, so it's a random Google search survey, it's not him. Um, but he's a very interesting figure uh, as well. He was a member of the Hindu Mahashava, uh, the uh, RSS kind of uh, group. Uh, and, uh, he, but he was a very, also, he was interesting because he was a very legit statistician. So he, was, he was a member of the Royal Statistical Society in London and so on. He had a professional uh, net uh, relations with uh, Ronald Fisher again, uh, in the UK statistician. Uh, so these are the people who then start investing in something called the nationalist statistics as a discipline. They start in terms of so what do they do to push back against the colonial narrative? So these are the three things mainly that they do. So first, there is this uh, intensive engagement with colonial data, the kind data that I said uh, the colonial state start to publish now. There is, so they, so they start reading the data and in various ways they start pushing back against the data. Sometimes they say that the data has not been collected in a standardized systematic way, so it's not scientific. Then they say you don't understand, uh, you have collected the data, but since you don't have social understand, you don't have an understanding of the social milieu, you don't have an understanding of why people are saying what they are saying, you are actually unable to interpret it properly. And that means only we as Indians familiar with the cultural context, we will be able to do that. So they are also, in pushing back against this narrative, they are also carving a space for themselves as more legitimate uh, statisticians and data connectors. But then they are not just engaging with colonial data, uh, that would be limiting. They are also actually building institutions to practice their own kind of uh, statistics uh, to establish themselves as legitimate experts of the discipline and they are also engaging with international collaboration and this is important because it shows that just because they are opposing or pushing back against the colonial state does not mean they are uh, foregoing any uh, intention to portray themselves as global experts. On the one hand they are pushing back against a colonial administrator say Herbert Rizzi but on the other hand they are very much uh, trying to develop relations and you know um, like equal collaborative uh, networks with Carl Pearson in Europe, Ronald Fisher, uh, and so on. So some of the examples, uh, just to give a quick sense of the kind of critiques they were doing. So these, uh, Mohan Ravish and Dr. the silhouette person, uh, these are some of the articles they are publishing. They are taking up uh, sections from, say, the census data, or the police record keeping, or even, um, uh, yeah, um, anthropometric data and they're publishing articles saying how we need to say revise Reasley. Reasley is the colonial uh, administrator who collected a lot of racial data in India. So you have something like revision of Reasley's data, you have uh, the need of an advisory committee. So again, pitching themselves as more legitimate experts in the field and then inaccuracies in the Bengal census. So this is one of the ways in which they're intervening in the discipline even trying to build up the discipline. Uh, then this is a, a photo of one of the primary institutions that is built in this context in this time period in the 1930s. Uh, the, Indian, uh, ins, the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata and now uh, it continues to function and it has several branches across India. Uh, this is the uh, this is a very, uh, contemporary image from uh, the Kolkata uh, branch. Uh, and Shonka is their in-house journal that is coming out at this time and it's important because a lot of these um, analysis that I'm doing is based on a lot of 
articles that are published in that uh, journal. And finally, examples of inter international collaborations, like I said. So there's Carl Pearson. Uh, again, I don't have uh, Jyoti Ramon Dutta's image uh, from the archives, but that, uh, that document basically his nomination papers to the Royal Statistical Society <laughs> that he was very much accepted by uh, Fisher and others of that time who were known as uh, internationally renowned statisticians. Then uh, this is Fisher and that's Mohananovich. So, so that this is the background or the context in which then one there is this colonial narrative of Indians being non enumerated and then there is a response from Indian intellectuals in various fronts. So pushing back against colonial data, but also institution building, also engaging in international networks and collaborations. But it was not just restricted to that, to that, which is why this history is important. It was not just a history of engaging or pushing back against that narrative. It was also about making a contribution to the discipline at an international level. So, but even as I discussed that original contribution of Mohalanovich in the Indian Statistical Institute, we will see how it, it, even that contribution is deeply embedded and informed by the needs and desires and motivations of the anti-colonial and nationalist pol political context. So this is something that uh, is used even today and obviously now it's been, uh, this is the racial origin that I mentioned in my title, but it's now removed. That narrative is uh, severed from its racial inception and now it's used for, as you can see, for various other things today that do not necessarily have racial context. So cluster analysis, financial risk assessment, robotics engineering, and so on. But at the same time, it's also used for facial recognition biometrics and that again brings us back to the racial context. Uh, so to briefly say what uh, this formula or theory does, Mohalanovich distance function. Basically, it, uh, so Mohalanovich devised this to determine whether, suppose you have on the right hand side, you have a group of data points. It can be from anything. It can be, say, um, anthropometric data points of a population. Uh, you have, and then on the left hand side, you can, you can have a single data point. And the distance between the group on the right hand side and the single point on the left hand side, that distance, if the distance is small, so beyond a certain limit, then you can conclude that the single data point actually belongs to the cluster. So imagine in racial terms, it would basically mean a racial group and an individual. If the distance is less, then this individual actually belongs to this racial group. If the distance is large, it means this individual belongs to a different racial group. So, but now, as you can understand, we don't need refer to the racial context, you can use it just to figure out if one particular data belongs to a cluster or not in terms by calculating the distance between the two. And this is the theory he devised which is used today uh, in various contexts. Uh, but it's interesting how he came up with this, uh, with this theory, uh, with this formula. So in the 1920s, when Malnovich was just starting out and um, he was not a trained statistician. He was, he got interested in statistics and statistical methods by reading Carl Pearson's. Uh, Carl Pearson is this race scientist, eugenicist and statistician in, in Europe, uh, turn of the 20th century. He was uh, well known then. Uh, so he had this journal called Biometrica and he had devised biometric methods or statistical methods to measure biological and racial phenomena. Right? Uh, so Mohanavish read that and he was interested in that. He wanted to develop a similar thing in India. Uh, at this time, he uh, was provided by some of the Zoological uh, Survey of India with a big racial data set of Anglo-Indians and several other caste groups. And their agenda or their motivation at the time was to figure out the racial relation between these groups. And this was not just an incidental or uh, just a hobby kind of thing. They actually wanted to know, and this is my argument because they have done a lot of other studies around this time, trying to understand basically what in terms of racial composition does India look like? What is, what are the different races or racial lineages that 
constitute India. And in the 1920s, this is a very fundamental political question. It is not just uh, not just knowledge for the sake of knowledge, because they at this time people uh, Indians, Indian intellectuals, elite Indians are already starting to envision a post-colonial nation. And for them, this is one of the fundamental questions. We have to know in the nation we imagine which group belongs to the subcontinent, which group has foreign lineage and foreign origin, and how do we rank them, how do we hierarchize them? So these statistics being developed out of this exigency, out of this political need. So there is this racial data set, and he uses this data set to come up with Mohan Rabishwita's function. So that's why uh, I mentioned this can be used today for other contexts, it is used today for other contexts, but it basically emerges out of the availability of a large extent racial data set of various caste groups and he used all of these to figure out that the distance between one data point and a cluster can actually give you that kind of theory and that kind of formula. So the motivation was to understand, uh, one of the motivations was to understand whether Bengali Muslims had local racial, had co completely like 100% of their blood type or racial type was local or did it have foreign origins that refer generally to origins in Central Asia or Western Asia. And the availability of this racial data set was what enabled Malmovish to come up with that particular formula. Uh, now to quickly mention that how this is an original contribution because uh, the Malmovish distance function is basically a, a massive improvement on the uh, pre-existing formula that people were using at this time. And this was Pearson, coefficient of racial likeness. But Pearson's formula had some limitations. Uh, for instance, it changed if you change the sample size of the group, whereas Mohalamavishas did not. Uh, and also Pearson's uh, formula could only tell you, uh, in terms of the answer was yes or no. So it could tell you that yes, these two groups are related, or no, these two groups are not related. But Mohalamavish was able to give magnitude to what it extent are these groups related and that was uh, in a like for the international statistics uh, discipline it was quite revolutionary. So this is one of my main arguments that this original contribution of Indian statistics is not just about the epistemological needs of the discipline outside its social political context or outside its social political drives. These were the different drives that enabled the formulation of this particular method or this particular contribution at this period of time from India. So there was the anti-colonial imperative, there was this need to develop statistics as a way of showing the colonial state that Indians are not non-enumerative and they are capable of forming a modern nation and governing it. There was the nationalist drive to build a nation in the sense to build a nation out of various ethnicities to know exactly which ethnicity, which racial group belonged where. There was the drive to present themselves as experts of the international scientific community, which was not disconnected from the anti-colonial or nationalist desire to showcase Indians as capable statisticians. And finally, there was the racial question, as I mentioned, in terms of wanting to know exactly what the racial composition of the nation is. This is also an example of, this is not to say that there were only racial imperatives and statistics, there were other social political imperatives as well, but that's my overall argument, right? To show the social drives or, or, or the way statistics as a discipline was informed by the social context of the time. So the other major contribution Mohan Rabish and his team at I um, had was um, uh, idea of the large scale sample survey. There were already ideas of it from that time, but again, he devised a way in which, so large scale sample survey, just to understand it quickly, would be something as opposed to a full enumeration. So instead of going to each individual in, say, in this room, I ask in each individual some uh, information about themselves, I ask two people here and two people there, and then extrapolate that data in a very precise uh, sophisticated analytical method so that I have the data, I can estimate the data for the whole group. 
So that would be large scale sample survey. Again, this was something that Mohanavish and ISI were able to devise among all other nations was because of the social need. Because Mohanavish kept insisting that in a country as vast as India, as poor as India, you cannot engage in full enumeration because that would take a lot of time and this was a critique against the census which uh, took a long time and was very expensive and have, could only happen every 10 years. So he devised the sample survey where you collect data from a very small group. But the statistical innovation is that that sample has to be determined in a very um, calculated way because it has to be very representative of the group. You can't just randomly select. So he had these imperatives, these social political imperatives of wanting to devise statistical methods that would be beneficial to the particular nation in which he was working. Um, so for the last year sample survey work, he was, uh, an inter uh, he was the delegate from India in the United uh, Nations Statistical Commission in 1946-47, and that's Fisher. Um, so finally, I come uh, to the last section of my talk, and Ooh. I look at this other trend in statistics, which also, in a way, sets the history of statistics in India slightly apart from what you know of the history of statistics in Europe or in the West. Because there, were, there is this focus on statistics, which is also the case in India, that it has to be developed as a field of expert knowledge. So you need training, you need, uh, you need to treat it as, an, as a discipline like you would treat any other. So there is an outsider-insider binary, there are certain types of passage and so on, right? So it is India, in India also we see statistics developing as a field of expertise, as a field of expert knowledge. But at the same time, it's interesting because in India, it's not restricted to that, especially because, again, because of the social political uh, context in which it is, uh, in which the nationalist institutions are being established. It's the 1920s, 30s, 40s. So one of the main drives, I said, in a developing nationalist statistics in India was a pushback or a critique of the colonial statistics or colonial state uh, undertaking statistics. So the nationalist uh, Indians were trying to push back against that. But if they pushed back against that and did the same kind of projects, they would they they thought they would lose legitimacy or they wouldn't even acquire legitimacy. So one of the fundamental things that Indian statisticians saw in terms of legitimacy was public approval. Because they wanted to establish that statistical reasoning is is the primary method of governance, but at the same time they're envisioning a post-colonial, anti uh, post-colonial, anti-colonial, a democratic state. And the fundamental thing in that democracy was the public. So if you just impose statistical method, like the colonial state had done on the public, it wouldn't, their nationalist statistics would not be legitimate in their opinion. So they needed public approval. So this was a major focus in a lot of their uh, publications, speeches, addresses, the constant need for public legitimacy. So the, those three are some of the phrases in various ways that keep appearing in all these speeches and lectures at this time. So we need a statistically minded public. And also if, you rem if you recall, this is also in a way harking back to the colonial narrative. Indians are not statistically minded. And as I said, they have internalized this. In fact, uh, J.M. Docto, the silhouette person, he has a publication where he actually uses that phrase that uh, we need to educate the public in to think statistically because otherwise they will keep using these Charlies, that, that absurd age range, 20 to 40. So they keep uh, talking about a statistically minded public. Uh, they talk about how statistics has to, sorry, that, that's a typo. Statistics has to increase in public esteem. Uh, and finally, the discipline has to contend against misleading phrases such as lies, damned lies, and statistics, which is a very popular phrase, but they were very, uh, they wanted to push back against it. They want, didn't want the public to believe that statistics is, is that. Now, the, through this, then there is this dilemma. On the one hand, you want to develop statistics so that you have international uh, contributions, you collaborate with these intellectuals and experts, you want people to be trained in statistics. So you have a public, the entire public trained in statistics, but at the same time you want public approval. So 
there was this contradiction because the public cannot be like everyone cannot be an expert, but at the same time you want the public to understand and approve the kind of statistical work you're doing, right? So out of this, one of the results out of this contradiction was in a way a dilution of the kind of statistical reasoning that was happening within institutions, right? So some of the things that I discussed, uh, the coefficient of racial likeness or uh, the large scale sample surveys. Those in a way remain restricted, those discussions remain restricted within institutional disciplinary spaces. But at the same time, in more public facing articles, um, these, these very same public intellectuals, so this is uh, Jyotin Ramal Dutt again, uh, that was Mohan Navish at some point, uh, I'll show it to you. Uh, so they start using the needed political, social, communal issues as the conduit through which establish calculative reasoning or disseminate the value of calculative reasoning among the public. So he, a lot of articles like these come up, which uh, these are just the titles of the public facing article, but if you go through the article, they are using a lot of data, not obviously very sophisticated analytical statistical calculations, but even things like percentages and proportions and starting to quantify certain categories, which certain very qualitative categories. So instance, talking about, say, the first uh, article, relative heroism. And this is not just a qualitative discussion of heroism between Hindus and Muslims that J.M. Dr. is engaging in. He's actually giving uh, a statistical breakdown, calculative uh, analysis of it. So he looks at the number of bravery awards a particular community has won and mapping that onto uh, the category of heroism, courage. And I'll show you uh, an excerpt from this article. Uh, if you can see, the, so he's not making a, so he's not making a merely qualitative argument, which a lot of people at that time are doing. But as a, he's, what he's doing is bringing his legitimacy, credibility as a statistician into these very communal and sectarian issues, and saying how Hindus are twice more ready to defend the nation and twice more loyal, and constantly uh, enumerating or giving a precise as if the semblance of precise enumeration of such qualitative features of such sensibilities and also adding to the communal tension at this time. And again, this is a map. Uh, that's an ex Those are examples from more public facing periodicals. But this actually was published in Shankha, the, um, the in-house journal of Palestine uh, uh, in, in the 19, uh, late 1940s. So already when um, there is this contention about uh, territorial partition of the subcontinent, Mohan Ravish publishes this map, this coded map. Again, this to me is an example of how this uses calculations and numbers, obviously, because you have this representation of uh, majority and minority in terms of uh, demography and territory, like which territory has more Muslims, which has more Hindus. So there is an enumeration at work, but at the same time, because it is a public facing work, it does not need you to understand, you don't need statistically educated or informed or literate. It's simply color-coded. So you can take a look at it and figure out questions about belonging and questions about um, uh, distribution and and, um, and the rest. So so basically, again, Mohan Ravish is on the one hand contributing to these very immediate, urgent political, social questions, but at the same time also using these issues as conduits to disseminate calculative reasoning among the public, uh, but also speaking to that contradiction where you can disseminate statistical reasoning, but it cannot, at the same time, it cannot be at the level that it is within institutions, within domains of expertise. And this is my final slide. So these are uh, some of the reflections. Uh, what does this history tell us? Why do, like, what does this history tell us about various other things? So one, I have tried to show that uh, building on existing scholarship that statistics emerges out of very social, very immediate social, racial, historical contexts uh, in the sense that what particular aspect or what particular method would would be developed often determined or at least in part determined by the social political questions of that time. Uh, I also in a sense argued for uh, argued that there are histories of there are 
piece of emergence of statistics. For instance, as I said, European scholarship has already shown that statistics is a historical development. It emerges at a particular point, at a particular context in Europe. But at the same time, that itself, that historicization does not mean that every context will then have a different history. It can simply mean that it has emerged in Europe in the 18th and 19th century, and then through colonialism, it's simply transported in other contexts. But these histories show us that in India, there was, of course, some overlap with the European history, but people were also developing it autonomously because they had different drives and different motivations. Um, to a broader history, I think this shows how uh, the, the history of calculative reasoning in India is significant because it shows how calculative reasoning was one of the major methods, significant methods, through which elite nationalism entrenched the divide between itself, the colonial state, and the public. Because again, these, um, as I've tried to show, the adoption of or the development of this statistical relative reasoning by Indian intellectuals was on the one hand very much pushed back against the colonial state. But at the same time, they were using, as I, as I showed with Mohanlabish distance function, that the same reasoning was also used to entrench or re existing hierarchies and to give them an objective, uh, an objective uh, semblance that caste and, and religious groups can be studied scientifically. So they contributed to that idea. Um, and finally, um, uh, I am I, trying to argue through this that the role of modern, modern statistics as a post-colonial objective method of state governance has a history of emergence and proximity with the exigencies of colonialism, anti-colonialism, elite nationalism, and nationalist race science. Thank you.